Hi, I'm Jen from Tea Leaves and Tweed, and here I talk about all things tea. So if that sounds like something you'd like, please make sure to subscribe to follow more of what I do. This morning I'm sharing another historically inspired tea session, inspired by a character that I've been enjoying in the show that is very loosely based on her rise to power on Hulu currently. So today we're having tea with Catherine the Great. So how many of you are watching The Great on Hulu? I love it. I'm actually watching it a second time and I'm catching things that I didn't even catch the first time. I know that there is some grumbling about the fact that it is completely historically inaccurate and takes fantastic liberties with the actual history, but I love the just like feel and emotions that it evokes and how they draw these parallels between historical revolution and modern revolution that needs to take place. So I'm loving it. And ages ago, it was requested that I do a tea session inspired by Catherine the Great. And I will be very honest with you, the one thing that has prevented me from doing this tea session is that I feel like I really can't talk about Russian tea without talking about smoked tea and without using a smoked or smoky tea because the kind of iconic tea that is associated with Russia is this Russian caravan tea. So now that I have found a smoked tea that I don't hate, and that is the smoked black tea from Old Ways Tea, which is a Wu Yi tea producer that I love, and I mostly love their yanchas, but their black teas are excellent too. So now that I have a tea that I like, I feel like I can actually do this video justice. So I'm actually going to start by steeping my tea because like many figures in the 18th century, Catherine the Great, if she enjoyed tea, would likely have enjoyed it steeped very, very strong and possibly diluted. So I'm going to steep my tea. I have my little packet of tea. So I've got my little packet of tea and I'm brewing in a porcelain gawan. Would Catherine the Great have brewed her tea in a gawan? Almost certainly not. It is pretty well documented that the teapot gained popularity over the gawan as tea spread out of China. However, I love the way this porcelain gawan coordinates with my antique Dutch teacup. And because I don't have a classical Russian porcelain cup, I have to use my Dutch teacup from Royal Copenhagen. And I just love the patterning on this. And of course the pattern dates to the late 17th century. So while this particular cup was probably from the mid to late 19th century, the pattern might have existed at the time of Catherine the Great. So we'll put our tea in. This is five grams of tea. And I have some boiling water. And I'm just going to let this go. Cover this up and let it steep for a little while. And while that's steeping, let's talk about tea in 18th century Russia. So if you look up casual sources on tea culture in Russia, you may find a statement to the effect of Russia's love affair with tea began in the 17th century when they were gifted with however many chests of tea by the Chinese emperor as part of a tribute or as part of a trade deal. And this is not exactly true. That 17th century trade deal, originally the Russians asked if they could have something else instead of the tea. They didn't want it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't drink it. And over the history of Russia, there had been some tea in the mid 17th century, a little bit going into the 18th century. And then one of the uh, emperors prior to Catherine stopped tea imports. So Catherine is actually credited with reopening the tea trade to Russia. And for that reason, 
She is usually also credited with popularizing tea culture in Russia, and that might actually be a bit of a stretch. In fact, there is some evidence that there wasn't that much tea imported into Russia during Catherine's reign, and it was very expensive. The source that I found estimated that if you only looked at the aristocracy drinking tea, the amount that was imported each year really only allowed for each person to have about a pound of tea and maybe a quarter pound of sugar, because sugar and tea have been kind of inextricably linked in the European world. So if you think about that, a tea bag is about two to two and a half grams. And if you just estimate a pound of tea as being 500 grams, which I realize is an overestimate, you can get about 200 cups of tea a year, which isn't bad. You wouldn't be able to have it every day, but you could have a pretty decent tea culture. However, if you wanted to sweeten your tea every time you drank it, a teaspoon of sugar is four grams. So a quarter of a pound of sugar would mean you'd really only be able to sweeten maybe an eighth of those cups of tea. So one of the things that was really interesting about Russian tea culture that persists to this day is that they sweetened their tea with fruit preserves. And fruit preserves were a fantastic way to take that small ration of sugar and stretch it because you can get, you know, two or three times as much volume out of a pound of sugar or a quarter pound of sugar if you make it into jelly or jam. So let's see how our tea is doing. This has a beautiful smoky, it's a very subtle smoky flavor. So the smoked tea story goes that in addition to the story about Tongmu village smoking their tea, oxidizing their tea and smoking it over pine branches to cover up the smell of the uncontrolled oxidation, there's also a story that Russian black tea was shipped over land because Russia was one of the few countries with a land border with China. So their trade didn't have to go by sea. And on that land journey, the caravans that brought the tea to Russia would stop for the evening and have a campfire. And those nights of stopping and having a campfire meant that this campfire smoke would kind of permeate the whole shipment. So there's this idea that this smoked tea is evocative of these overland shipments of tea from China into Russia. So that is why I felt like I had to use a smoked tea for a Russian inspired tea session, particularly one that is inspired by an 18th century ruler, because that is before tea production in the Soviet republics began. So I think our tea is getting pretty strong. And then Russian tea culture, even in the 17th and 18th centuries, by the 18th century, the samovar did exist. So the tea culture would have been to brew a strong tea and then dilute it to your liking with hot water using the samovar. Of course, I don't have one. I was very tempted to buy many things for this video, Russian teacups, a samovar, but I have decided not to. So I do have some hot water if the tea is too strong for me, and I have a little bit of cherry preserves. This is a French cherry preserves. And you could either hold the preserves in your mouth and then sip the tea through it. They also did this with lumps of sugar, which is something that I was fascinated with as a teenager. Or you can stir the jam right into your tea. So the hot tea kind of melts the jam a little bit, but there are some bits of fruit. So a little bit more about the great. I have been loving the characterization of Catherine. Obviously it is very idealized. All of the characters seem very idealized. Peter is idealized. He was not nearly as attractive and debonair as he is in that series. He also wasn't the son of Peter the Great. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. The smoky tea with the cherry preserves is 
really neat. It almost reminds me of when they add cherries to barbecue sauce. And I know that sounds terrible, and I know I made a barbecue joke in my Lapsang Sushang video, but... Such an interesting flavor combination. So, I think I like it. Huzzah! Well, maybe not. This has been Tea with Catherine the Great. I hope you enjoyed this historically inspired tea session, and I hope I see you again sometime. Thanks.